Welcome to the Deer Society Podcast. Here's your host, Brian Lemke. Well, hey, everybody. Welcome back to the Deer Society Podcast. First one of the brand new year. So if we haven't talked, which we haven't. Happy 2022. Happy New Year, everybody. Uh, exciting things rolling into this year. Uh, before we get kicked off here, I just want to take a minute to thank a few of our partners um, You know that overall help us be successful, helped us be successful last year and year in and year out. You know, one of the cool things here at the Deer Society is, you know, you guys have built Illusion, this great thing. And, you know, you've always prided yourselves on working with only partners and products that you really believe in. And that's what we do here. So just a quick shout out, you know, Tacticam and Reveal, still running those cameras all the time right now, uh, year round, big time. We're looking for shed bucks actually right now. Burris, Osseo, 10 Point, Raw Frozen Sense, Big Frig, and of course, Illusion. Just wanted to, to give everybody a shout out there. We appreciate everything that they do. And really, we use them because they help us be more successful out there. Yeah, we're going to break down some tactics today with some of those products too on the shed hunting side and on the uh, late season hunting end of things too with with uh, warm season gear and stuff like that. So yeah, great products. Yeah, you know, and, and really that's what the Deer Society platform is all about. Um, it, it, it's about trying to help people be more successful at their sport. And, you know, it takes certain products fit into that. You know, and and for us to find out the ones that really do help and, uh, you know, get them as partners, it's, you know, it's a success for everybody involved, especially our viewers. So it's not just, you know, we don't need these partnerships, you know. I mean, in fact, for many, many years, we never partnered with anybody because we want to protect the Illusion brand because we knew those products were helping be people be more successful. So this is kind of new for us, but uh, yeah, it's a good way to... Uh, let the consumers or the uh, the viewers and uh, followers know. You know, these are things that help. Yeah, absolutely. And and you know, those these partnerships are always advancing. And you know, the cool thing is, we just had some calls with with some cool potential partners for this year, twenty twenty two, coming up. Um, so some really cool things to look forward to, um, especially from the habitat side of things as well. So some cool cool things coming there. Um, so where are we? We're into the new year. We're January. It is cold here in Minnesota. We have sub-zero temperatures and uh, we have some bucks that are shed, some that aren't, most aren't. Um, that's just, like I said, here in, in Minnesota. It's weird because in Wisconsin, just across the river, um, you know, it seems like a lot of the bucks are starting to shed over there. So, you know, sim similar circumstances, but uh, a lot of our deer are still holding. So what's going on, guys? What uh, What's ringing in the new year for you? Well, I'll just start out with my, uh, um, you know, opinion on that particular topic. And it's kind of like deer hunting season. All of a sudden, all these, sh you know, deer start popping up on Facebook and social media and everything. And you're like, dude, there's deer being shot everywhere, you know, but just look at the size of the market, you know? So I think if you just, if you kind of look at it in relevancy, um, there's a lot of people showing that they're finding sheds. We have a few deer that are starting to drop their sheds, but for the most part, it's not happening here in Minnesota or where we are. Let me put it that way, where we are. Yeah, we're running quite a few of the reveals still um, in the off season, and every morning I wake up a couple times that night too. Wake up, look at trail camera <laughs> pictures, try to figure out if any bucks have shed or who's still alive. But um, the only one that I think has shed so far had a bad injury. Um, that was a buck we call Seven Up. So, and actually got a picture of him him here about a half hour ago, I believe, um, a fully shed buck. So. He had a pretty bad injury, so a lot of that energy goes into, you know, healing his body. And um, I know that those bucks typically shed early. Um, they don't put as much nutrition back into those antlers. They start to deteriorate up there and fall off earlier. So he shed both sides. And then I've only seen a couple one-year-olds with half racks. That's about all I've seen so far. Um, yeah, people. I mean, people are putting pictures on social media, finding some sheds, but it's one or two here and there. Um, I think 90, 90 to 95% of bucks here still have both, 
both sides from what I, I'm seeing on, on the reveal so far. Yeah, I, I got to agree with that. Um, I'll add one more element to that. Um, we haven't had, it, it, it is about stress. So that's the part where I really think, you know, you have to look at, it's about stress. So if you don't have a lot of food in your area, um, you know, where maybe a buck is hanging out, I might, you might see their sheds drop a little bit earlier. Um, but you have to put that up with what other kinds of stress are they having? It's not just food. It could be weather. And I am going to predict that in the next week, starting today, actually, because we just saw 7-Up drop his other shed. We're in the middle of an Arctic blast right now and in Minnesota. We're talking 37 below wind chills yesterday, below uh, uh, zero regular temperatures. And so that's it'll be a full week pretty much coming up here by the end of this week. We'll get a little bit of a break um, during the daytime on the weekend, and it's going to go right back to super cold starting next week. And I'm watching, once again, I refer to my backyard. Um, it, it's kind of cool because I can study deer back there because we do have a lot of urban deer. But I just watch what they're doing. And today they were in that thing that I've talked about many times into that kind of like a mild hibernation mode, I call it. They were balled up sitting in the pine needle beds with the sun beating on them. And I mean, their heads were tucked down in. It was a ball. They weren't sitting up with their head propped up, you know, with their eyes skin, you know, kind of closed. They were like balled up. And they're just trying to shut down and imagine if you were lost in the woods and you were trying to survive that night, how you just ball up and you just wouldn't move and you'd just be trying to survive it. And they're able to, the deer, I believe, are able to shut down that metabolism that way. And I think that's how they do that survival. But once again, we're talking about the weather stress. I think sheds are going to start dropping here left and right in the next week. And, and starting now, actually. It's so cold here <laughs> that we would literally die in 30 minutes outside. That's a fact. That's a fact. If we didn't have our jackets and our nice warm clothes and warm boots, and we would die in 30 minutes. But the thing And they is, just live out there. They just live out there. But That's the thing crazy. Is, we are, and we're going to get into talking about cold, I think, aren't we? Yeah. Uh, and gear and stuff like that. Um, but I grew up in this. And so... Now I'm dating myself. You see these little memes on Facebook where they got a, a empty bag of Wonder Bread, and that used to be our boot liners. And that's the truth. That's how we kept our feet dry. We would put our foot it's in a vortex. yeah, it's yeah, yeah. So <laughs> I know it sounds crazy, but that's what we did. And then if you ever watch that um, Christmas show. Uh, which one is it where the red BB gun, the Red Rider BB gun? Christmas story. Yeah, Christmas story. When they show that little kid go out and he's so bundled up, he can't move because yeah. <laughs> they put so many layers on you. That's how we had to keep warm. That's just the way, it, honestly, it was. And you'd put socks on your hands and you'd put your mittens on. And it was just, that's the way it was done. And uh, yeah, it's kind of crazy if you think about that. But if you've grown up in something like that, and you've been guaranteed in situations where you are so cold, you start to get used to it. You do. And that's why you see these crazy people at the football game down in Green Bay taking their shirts off. You know, granted they're drunk, but you know, they can withstand it for a longer period of time. You can. Because like now, we'll go through this winter blast. If it warmed up to 40 degrees from 10 below, or 30 or 40 below windshields, and it went to 40 degrees, I guarantee you, you'll see people running around out there with just a sweatshirt on, like it's spring or summer. Because it does feel that way to us. Now, granted, I picked up 10 pounds and added a little bit of belly fat to the, you know, over the holidays, but, you know, we do that up here too. You got to put on that winter insulation. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, we're going to talk about some cold weather stuff, and it, it is cold, you're right. You know, JJ, I want to bounce back to the trail camera thing and waking up in the morning. I'll tell you, I think this is the the time of year that people will get a picture and they'll zoom in on it. And, and you always want to be the that guy that you see on the internet. And it's like, 
you pick apart every weed in every corn stalk that's sticking up out of the snow in your drone <laughs> camera picture that you get on on, on your, your phone. It's like, okay, well, there's a deer. Yeah, that's great. But, oh, what's that behind him? Is that a shed? And you convince yourself every single time that it's a shed and you got to get out there and find it. I don't know. This year, that's the goal is, is somebody's going to get a shed actually falling on trail camera. What do you think? Well, last year on the reveal, we actually remember I had that moment up in by Captain's Corner where there was drops of blood on camera. And the deer would walk by and they would start to smell it. Yep. Never did find that shed, so I don't know what that was all about. <laughs> <laughs> but two days ago on one of our cameras, I did see uh, what I thought could be an antler. And I think it was ended up being a corn leaf. I was kind of curved, but I ended up, I have to, I had to go back like two days prior to see like, is this thing still on camera? Like <laughs> two days before, because this deer walked by that looked like a buck, could have been just a big doe. And it was kind of like smelling this, this area on the ground by the cornfield. And it was kind of a curled up leaf. I believe it is now, but just had to scroll back a couple days just to make sure it was that there, you know, like two, three days ago, was that uh, an antler? You know what? And I, it was still there. So it, it's not an antler, but yeah, hopefully. I, That'd be pretty cool. They're sparring on camera. Well, a that's lot just right it. Now. I did. I did the same thing. It was. Remember when I told you there's a. I thought there was a shed dropped at the dam. You know, and so there was two bucks that had been sparring there, and they kind of spar there in front of the camera for some reason. I don't know why, but they do. And so they were sparring, and all of a sudden they disappeared. And then I'm like, well, there's something right there where they were. And then it, I kept looking at all the pictures from that day and the next day, and I saw a deer go by and put their nose down on that spot, and I'm like. God, I think that's a shed. I really do. But we haven't been out there to go look yet because we don't want to bump the deer out of there. Yeah, that's the thing. I, I always think about uh, when I see a squirrel on there too. Now I think, hmm, there's no reason a squirrel should be there right now. So I'm thinking, well, maybe there's just a shed just off screen there where I can't see it. And he was over there chewing <laughs> on that shed and he ran by and, and caught him. But um, no, lots of good stuff. I do want to make a public service announcement here. Uh, if you guys are watching and you've watched in the past, you'll notice that Mike and JJ typically dress alike and they are wearing <laughs> completely different things today. Also, they have switched seats on me. So I don't know if this is a new year thing, but sorry if you're watching to throw you off, but Mike and JJ are throwing some curveballs here in 2022. But. Well, let's get into uh, some shed hunting strategy because, you know, I think that obviously people are starting to find sheds. I have found one shed this year already uh, over in Wisconsin. Um, but uh, let's talk about what that strategy is once antlers start to fall. And I think we should start off by talking about exactly what Mike you just touched on. Um you know, you don't really want to go in there too early. You want to pick the right time to go shed hunting. It's kind of like hunting. You never want to go in there and blow out your spot and blow the deer out before you really have the best chance to kill them. Well, shed hunting is really similar in certain ways because you don't want to go in and blow out all your deer and bump them over to your neighbors in different areas and they shed over there. Then you're not going to find any sheds. First rule of shed hunting. If you want to find a shed, go to where deer are shedding. So JJ, what do you think? What's, what's your strategy coming up here, shed hunting? Well, we got kind of a neat, unique situation, and we talked about, I think, in the last podcast, but we potentially have loggers coming in here soon. And I kind of don't want that now because I see a lot of bucks on camera with their antlers. <laughs> Still got them. Um, so we're just kind of sitting, waiting, yeah, trying to stay out of there. But on the other hand, it's like you got a log at some point too. So we're trying to – maybe we can wait until like mid-March – um, to have the loggers come in, I think most of the bucks should shed by then. I kept looking back at last year's pictures, trying to figure out when they were shedding last year, and just kind of going to wait until most of the bucks at you know this season kind of hit those dates, and then we'll we'll go in there and you know we're using the reveals like I said a lot right now, and we'll do doing a little scouting, um, you know, glassing at night in the fields and stuff like that. But um, yeah, just kind of wait for that magic moment. I like to wait till the end of March. That's kind of like my comfort zone it also depends on the snow level too um we could have two three feet of snow or it could be all melted off and sometimes it's good to have snow you know especially in a cornfield get a nice even blanket across that so you can see a shed compared to when the snow melts off of the cornfield it looks like it can it's just impossible so and maybe you know maybe you go in a couple times um going early just do some field edges and stuff keep it keep it light play the wind um, have clean boots, do a midday uh, quick pass, wear some good binoculars, and then maybe you do more of that grid surge thing later on too. So there's a couple different strategies, um, but I think we got at least another 
at least another month before the mo- most or, most of the bucks shed. Mike, I'm curious, what's your thought on deer shedding year after year? Do you think these deer, uh, from what you've seen, shed kind of around the same time each year or different? Or what are your thoughts there? You know, I don't really know. I The shed hunting thing, I've never been real, uh, you know, big on for a long period of time. Now, obviously, that we have our own property, we kind of started getting more into the shed aspect. Before, it would be just kind of randomly, you know, just kind of look around or see if there was an opportunity to go to walk someplace for sheds, basically to get some exercise, you know? And so I, I'm not that big into it. I don't have a ton of experience with it. Um, I believe we're starting to watch that. And so I'm kind of relying on JJ's reconnaissance and that's where these trail cameras come in. It's, it's such a big deal. Um, when are they going to shed? We had one hold really, really late, but didn't you say that he dropped earlier the year before? Yeah, so <clears throat> a buck that we call Peyton, um, Chris found his three-year-old shed. I think we found it in March, but I saw I had him on camera. I was like, he shed in February for sure um, that year, which was two years ago. And then last year, he shed mid-April. Um, he actually left our property at that point. He didn't, it was like spring, you know. Um, shed somewhere else, who knows where, but yeah, it was mid April. So, I mean, that's I, two I, months apart and that's, that's a little bit. So I guess to answer your question, based off what we're learning now, I think it's as much, if not more a stress factor as it is, you know, they drop the same time every year. Now, if things are consistent, I think you'll find that, you know what I mean? But so if you have a consistent winter, you have consistent food, you have, con, you know, no injury and things are consistent, I think you would find that there, that probably is the case, you know, just because that's the makeup of the animal. Um, but yeah, we're going to have to watch that. It's an interesting angle to it. Um, but really, I think the, uh, the stress and doing your tactics through the trail cameras and kind of watching how things are unfolding, I think that's basically the way we're shed hunting. And you can't find a shed on your property if they don't shed it on your property. So once again, don't go in there and blow up the timber. Now, it's a kind of a catch-22 as well, because if you know there's this big major blizzard coming, right, about the time where you know deer are dropping sheds, you may want to get in there, or you're going to set yourself back another month or weeks, yeah. And also on the timber side, timber right now is so hot, let's put it that way. If we get an opportunity for them guys to come up here, then we got to let them come up here. I mean, there's just really, we can't say no because then we might miss the window. Because if you get into April and May, then you get into that window where they can't take it because something to do with the Well, the oak. ground is soft. Well, the, well, that and the oaks too, right? There's something with their, they can get leafy and then you get like a, what is it, a fungus or a mold or a spore? Yeah, a bunch of different, bunch of different variables. But yeah, mostly you want them to come in when everything's dormant and when the ground's nice and frozen so they're not, and tearing, not tearing stuff snow. up yeah. too bad. So hopefully that's end of March. Because that timber thing is big to us, not because we want the money for the timber, which we do because we just bought a skid loader. It'll help with that. But it's, that's infrastructure. That's infrastructure and it's um, management. You know, so we're going to be able to make some major, major improvements by having a timber cut because this particular piece of, um, you know, woods that we have needs it. Right on. Well, that's super interesting. And that deer, you know, that you talked about, um, that, that shed so far apart, you know, between three and four is super interesting. I, I, from my experience in running trail cameras and, and shed hunting over the years, deer will typically... I found shed uh, pretty close to when they they do, did the previous year. You know, year after year, it's kind of a habitual thing. I think it's, um, you know, it's just like I think you find uh, a mature deer sheds in similar places every year because they've learned that that's a place that they feel comfortable and they can thrive there. Now, to your point, Mike, I agree with you. There, There's a lot that can influence that you know those might be under similar conditions year after year where you know something like an injury or something like intensive winter stress um that'll that'll also change that i was actually talking to a guy yesterday 
um, out west. Um, and he was saying, and he was talking uh, some about whitetails, but mule deer too. Um, all, he was surprised that all their mule deer or all their deer were still carrying, um, and expected them to shed really soon because of the drought that they had, uh, this year and the amount of stress that they have been under. Um, he noticed a lot more deer that were broken up this year. Um, and he kind of attested that to, the drought and antler growth and some different things too. So it'll be interesting to see, you know, out West, maybe are those deer going to shed a little earlier because of the drought that they had? Um, you know, what those stresses do is, is interesting. Um, you know, year after year, how, how deer and when deer shed their horns. What, uh, let's talk about, uh, shed hunting locations. So, you know, your guys' farm, your approach, JJ, you talked about having a few different approaches. What, uh, you know, where are you looking for sheds when they drop them? Well, the easiest spot is going to be a, a field, a wide open field that you can see, you know, a long distance and see anything that looks, um, that sticks out. So like I would think beans, um, or a hay field or something like that would, would look pretty good. I struggle with corn quite a bit. Our cornfields chisel plowed too. We'll see how that looks. I don't know. It's just there's so much like breakup and contrast and different shapes and stuff um, when it comes to corn that I just always struggle and kind of get dejected and, and quit early. <laughs> <laughs> um, but that'd be where I would start for sure as a food source early if I want to do like a two-stage approach or a three-stage approach. Start early. Maybe we hit some food up here in the next couple of weeks. Um and then wait to really dive into that thick stuff until, you know, you know, most of your bucks have shed. I think right now is another cool thing you could do now is, especially since we have the snow, is you'll see all the trails where they're going to be heading back into the bedding area. So at least you can like take note, like while there's a lot of traffic going into this knob or this area and maybe I'll, I'll wait a month, but you know, I'm going to hit that pretty heavy. Um, cause the snow also tells you where the dead sea is too, where you, there's like zero, tracks of deer and they're just not hanging out there's no food there's so snow can tell you a lot um but yeah you don't want to bump them out either so it's hard to hard to balance that yeah i i i think i'm kind of on track with that like i say we don't have years and years of years of experience at it but um based on what we've experienced before we had our own uh property uh not being able being able to walk Food sources, for the most part, I would say that's a fair analysis. There wasn't really a lot of food sources where we always had permission to hunt. It was just kind of random walking, you know, and it was it was basically looking, where's the deer sign and that kind of thing. And we didn't find a ton of sheds that way. But then when we bought the property, we didn't have any food on it. Um, so we were walking all deer activity. And we were looking at bedding and we didn't have any hinge cutting or anything done like that. And we were finding sheds on the trails or right off of the trails. And by the way, it's tough to kind of pick that out too when you have snow and sticks sticking out of the snow. Every stick that's got, a, you know, a Y to it looks like a, a rack, uh, with, if, especially if it doesn't have any bark on it, you know. And uh, so, yeah, that can be tricky. But then when you see one, it's like, oh, there it is. You know, it's obvious. It's like, whoa. Then you run over there and, and find it. But I would say as, we've, as we're starting to progress here with food, really this is the first, second year of food. Last year we had a little bit of corn, but that would be the only winter food we had other than. And it was gone. And it was like totally gone. So they wiped the whole thing out. Did we find a shed in the corn? Chris found one close by. One close by. But other than that, we found it in pretty much bedding or transition on the trails last year. Now, this year we have beans. We have a lot of food. They haven't eaten it all. So that gives us a good idea of well, how much food do we really need to leave out here. And, of course, the neighbors are managing and putting in food sources too. So this is going to be a very big learning year. Um, I've talked to people, well, on the land that we did hunt, we don't shed hunt it because he likes to shed hunt it. That's where we got curly. And he found in, they had beans were got caught in one year in the winter. And I've been a big advocate of this in Minnesota. And I'm going to say Minnesota where we are, because I don't know if it works that way all across the country. But if you put that protein in and then beans and you leave it up during these harsh, harsh conditions, you are going to see a massive amount of 
deer, along with a higher ratio of bucks, trying to get that protein to get that muscle mass built back up. Because if you're looking at these deer this time of the year holding their racks, it's like, well, what deer is that? It's not as easy to recognize them because their body mass is gone. You know, you got four-year-olds that look like they got a two-year-old body. You know what I mean? And so they need that protein to build that muscle mass back on. So I'm actually very excited to get out into those bean fields that we put in this year and left up all year and that we've been getting um, uh, pictures of, you know, double-digit numbers in the evenings on certain days. I mean, they're, they're hammering it. Yeah, just visually, I just kind of try to picture – past shed hunting seasons and stuff. I know last year I had a lot of success in the timber when it was cloudy and the snow was 100% gone. Then you can just see through all those branches and, you know, see all the white stuff that sticks out. When the snow was there, it was almost impossible. Like a snowy, sunny day. I feel like, I mean, you could walk two feet from a shed and you'd never even see it. So picking the right days is huge. I love when the snow is gone for the most part, except for that corn. I feel like you just have an inch or two on that corn, at least it covers the, the ground level to where you can just see through the rows a little bit better. So really got to pay attention to the, around here, the snow depth and the weather is a big thing. Yeah. I got a funny little story last year. I was I actually deleted the video because I was embarrassed by myself, but I was walking around, you know, filming a little bit for white tails from scratch, shed hunting. And then I saw a shed over there, like 30 yards away in a nice bedding knob where I, I found skyscraper shed one year a year past got out my phone filmed a little video had the binoculars got the binoculars on you know on the video and made sure you know it was definitely a shed and filmed myself walk over there and i went to grab it and i was still you know self-filming and it was a stick <laughs> 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 and i got the binoculars on it and it was like one oh that's 100 percent a shed and i like filmed my whole entry over there like oh we got it what, who do we got here i don't know who it is <laughs> and i i dropped down and i pick it up and i'm like you know just quit recording delete it and i just kept walking that's hilarious Fuzzy. super embarrassing well there's so many things out there that that you mistake for sheds you know but that that's part of it being exciting you know you can go out there and walk and not pick up a shed but you probably spotted seven that you thought were sheds yeah. that, that gets you pumped up you have to have binoculars though that is crucial in my opinion yep. i will say uh along with funny stories i have one uh and the moral of the story is don't don't forget to look up because i was uh in illinois one time i was shed hunting with pat reeve and and uh he was walking this field edge and i was walking just below it and i was coming up and he was kind of coming into the woods and and i stopped and and he saw me and he was about 15 yards away and he looked at me and he said ha ha and i i didn't know what he was talking about I'm like, what? He goes, well, you obviously put that one there. And I said, what do you mean? He said, well, that one hanging in the tree next to you. And I'm like, uh, what? And I turned and I looked and sure enough, there's this little four point side and it's hanging about, I don't know, waist level in the tree right behind me and never saw it. Never. And it, it was clear as day to him, you know, when we walked in there, but that was the thing. He thought I had hung it in the tree there. So, you know, don't forget a good hanger still counts as a, as a shed. And so, but I, you know, shed hunting is, it's an interesting thing. And, and shed hunting has really changed for me over the years too. I used to be the guy that just, man, grew up in Pennsylvania and there wasn't any standing food. And it was just like, you hear about people finding sheds and you go out and you just walk, right. And you just walk aimlessly and you, you think you're going to find one and you hope. And it was just a prayer. And yeah, I found a couple, but never really, you know, had a lot of success and I've learned so much. And, and it's such an exciting thing for me now because it's, it goes back to almost like that hunting thing. You know, it's like you're scouting, it's trying to understand the deer. It's trying to understand where they are, where they're going to shed, where they're going and, and coming and going from to find those high percentage areas where you're going to find sheds. Now, let's face it, a deer could shed anywhere, but where are you going to focus your time? You're going to focus it in high percentage areas. So you may not be going to shed hunt until March, end of March, April even, who knows? But you have to understand that, at least here, the deer are between now and then actively shedding. So Go out and pay attention to see where those deer are bedded. Deer's bedroom, in his bed, great place to find sheds. 
that transition area, the trails that are walking between there and food, because that's what they're doing right now. They're going from bed to food. Transition areas, those trails, great place to find them. Find more sheds than anything on edges. So habitat breaks, deer, deer are edge creatures, right? So those edges, if there's a CRP transition area, you know, a lot of times those deer will shed between, you know, there instead of in the food source where they're kind of, um, you know, spending more time. So I think, you know, for me, shed hunting is about finding the sheds, but it's about thinking on the front end, uh, that game of, okay, where are those high percentage places where you can potentially find a shed? You know what I mean? So I, I, I like that uh, situational strategy aspect of shed hunting along with picking up the shed. Yeah, you know, and with that being said, you know, we can take all this information and we can process it. And, you know, the video or not the video, but the trail camera scenario and tool is something that we're definitely using quite heavily because we are not going in the timber. And I just want to say we're not moving those trail cameras for shed purposes that may change in the future but at this time we aren't so we already know their behaviors we know their social areas we know where they transition we know where they're feeding we know where they're bedding for the most part we don't put any cameras in beds by the way uh, never have i don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing we just have never done it we don't want we want zero and i'm going to say this definitely aggressively zero human presence in a bedding area. That's just the way we do it because we don't want to push them deer out of there. Now, think about it. You go by a corn or you go by, you know, a transition area or a water hole or whatever. We're hunting when we want the deer to get up and start moving. If we bump a deer there, where do they go? Where do they go to hide? Where do they go for safety? They go back to that bed area. Well, if that's not a safety area for them anymore, then where are they going to go? Somewhere else. It's really that simple. If you just want to look at it that simply, that's our core strategy. So with that being said, we're watching their behavior, and they're still finding each other in these social transition areas. And they're sparring, which really surprises me. That Because I would, in my mind is like, geez, the wrecks are got to be getting ready to f fall off. Why are they st sparring now? You know what I mean? And you can tell what deer are friends and what deer aren't friends too, I think, by who's hanging out with who. So we kind of, we're getting an idea of the bachelor groups. So my brain's just turning here. You know what I mean? I'm looking at all the information and I'm trying to figure out based on camera intel, all these things that we just got done talking about. You know, oh, well, they're sparring there. I think I'm going to find some sheds in this social area on the edge where they always tend to go. It's an old scrape. It's an old area where they hit. Then there's this one up there where they always come out to go into the food. And I see them go out to the food. So I'm thinking that, you know, there's going to be sheds out there on that knob and, and out there. And they always come through this one little um, gap in the fence where there's a little bit of apple they try and knock out of the tree. And by the way, there's still crab apples sitting up in them trees. You know, so there's still a little bit of, you know, dessert laying around too with the fruit. And I think they start hitting that, uh, that blueberry on the, um, cedar? no, well, the cedars too, but the buckthorn. And so that's where you start seeing that blue pea, you know. So, yeah, those are things that I'm just trying to assess it all and, you know, say, hey, if I was a buck and based on what I'm seeing, where's the best chance for me to find them? And then I look at the history. Where have I found sheds in the past? Well, Little Splitter, is, I think it was a Little, yeah, Little Splitter was in his bed right next to a log. He was overlooking the farm farmyard, you know. So there's traffic going by him. You've seen all the activity and he just, that was a bed for him right by a log and a certain wind. And he just, I guarantee you, he just reached up with his hooves and just went pop, pop. Because they were laying right next to each other. He's like, I'm sick of these. You know what I mean? And then you might have s some more other deer, like younger, like popping, you know, popping them off because they're sparring. Um, maybe they get caught on a branch. A deer, uh, that's uh, Blind 10, found his shed off a main trail in a transition area and it caught a branch and popped it off just the one side and it laid there off to the side of the the heavy snow trail and the snow was real deep at that time you know 
And then I know you've found stuff later up in the grass areas in the um, cedars. So there's just, but this neighbor that we, or this, but this friend that allowed us to hunt on his land, yeah, he would find a bunch of sheds out in those beans. So I'm kind of excited about that. That's my strategy going forward. Yeah, and you were talking about the kind of the bedding sanctuary. You know, we don't go that go in there ever until shed season comes around. So it's nice to take your time and go slow and scout, like Brian was saying, as you're shed hunting too. Not just you know blaze a trail. No, is there any sheds? You know, like look around. Are there any tree stand trees? Can you you know hunt in here? Where do the deer bed? What kind of wind? Like rubs, scrapes. Just kind of take it all in because we don't ever go in there any other time of the year. So I kind of like to go slow. You know, when the snow is all gone, um, again, that overcast, cloudy day, maybe a little rain, go slow, use an app like Onyx, track your trails, you know, try to really grid search it, go that's slow. A, that's a really good tip, by the um, way. And if you're walking with somebody else, like we, when me, you, and Chris, and I, I don't know if you were there that same day, but we all had our tracking systems on, and then we looked like, oh, where'd you walk? Where did I walk? And, you know, did we miss any spots? So you can kind of see that too. Um but yeah, just I, I like to take my time because for some it's like you need to have that eye kind of trained to find the sheds. It's kind of like when you're mushroom hunting and you can't find a morel mushroom, and all of a sudden you find one, you start looking around. There's like 15 there, you know. It's like your eyes aren't aren't used to seeing that certain thing, um, but once you you got to kind of like train your mind and you know find one that oh that's what it looks like, and then sometimes I even walk around and just keep throwing it around, see if I can find it myself. Um, to just try to train my own mind. And I don't know if you want to hit on, you know, doing that with your dog a little bit I was too, just going to say, now it's time to start talking about the big movement or whatever you want to say, and that's the dogs. And we're going to, well, us here at the table are going to start that process at some level. Yeah. And I we're going to jump into that before. I just want to touch on one thing before we leave what JJ said is, it sounds silly, but I will do it. Um, and I know a guy who does it every time he goes out shed hunting is he'll take a shed and he'll have it in his truck and he'll throw it out there 15 yards, 20 yards out there in the woods. And he will go and pick up that shed and just look at it and tries to get it into a close environment of where he's shed hunting because of that reason. Exactly. Just to get his mind and his brain and his eyes used to seeing that in that type of environment. It's a trained thing because it's true. Once you see one shed, you're like, oh, that's what they look like. You know, so there's a lot to be said about that. Um, yes, dogs. Dogs. So um, I have a shed dog. Chris has a dog. Um, I know that you guys have been talking a bunch to Jeremy Moore over there at Dogbone. Um, you know, he does amazing things over there. Um, definitely going to to try to incorporate um, some dog situations this year and, and use their help to find sheds. Um, JJ, what instance do you think that you'll use dog most here uh, coming up this spring? Standing corn. <laughs> no, absolutely. Just corn in general. I can't see a shed in corn at uh, all. Well, I don't think any, it's really tough, especially like this year, our corn got blown down in this like weird winter storm. Yeah, we where had the tornadoes, tornadoes came, came through. through. Um, I, I just want to back up just a shade here. And we met Jeremy at the ATA show this just what was it? not very long ago, a few weeks ago, right? Yep. And I just want to say that was my first time to meet the, the guy and being of a like mind, if you will, only maybe in a later stage of business or life or however you want to say it, the guy's just so on track and so intelligent and so in tuned to things where he takes in all this information and he processes it. And it's just, it's such a treat to talk with people that, their brains are wired similar to yours because you could just sit there and go forever and ever. But of course we had to do a little bit of business too, but no, we were right next to each other and we were, we talked quite a bit at that. And I just want to uh, put a big shout out um, to what's going on over there with him and, and his, uh, um, his businesses and his products. And it's, it's pretty uh, exciting and, and, you know, it's the real deal. Let me just say that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Jeremy is the one who, who got me excited, uh, from the start about having a shed dog. Um, you know, my dog's a family dog, but, but I've trained him from the word go. 
um, as a shed dog. So he, he actually picked up five sheds last year, um, just turned a year old on Christmas. So he's still young. Um, but, uh, I, I'm hoping that he's going to do some pretty cool things this year. We've been, we've been working a lot together and pretty exciting. And Jeremy has been at the, at the foundation. Jeremy's been a friend of mine for a long time and, and we've done business with them and very intelligent, great guy. And it's really cool. You'll have to see him. And it sounds like we're going to get the chance to, to see him work with his dogs out in the field, um, some more because the patience he has and the understanding he has for those dogs is incredible. Oh, you should have seen his dogs at that show. You would have no idea that he had the dogs at the show. They sat on that platform and you did not you didn't know they were there. And then this other guy's going around with this remote control thing and dog patrol, and he's buzzing it by, and all this stuff is going on, and the dogs just sat there and looked. They didn't react. I mean, they were so well-trained. I've never seen nothing like it. So, you know, dogs for shed hunting, obviously, I, I'm sure that you can understand the benefits of that. You know, uh, my dog, for example, he's not shed hunting based off sight. I mean, we, we do a lot of training with him with a white antler in the snow. Um, you know, you're, you're training them to use their nose, um, more than anything, obviously they're using their sight too, but training them to use their nose. And I don't want to talk in detail about it because, you know, it's not necessarily my expertise, but, um, you know, benefits of having a dog in a standing cornfield. I mean, they, they have a, a way better chance of using their nose and, and covering more ground and more efficiently than we do, uh, by a thousand fold. Um, so it'll be cool to, to utilize them, you know, to do some shed hunting this year and, um, hopefully brings, uh, brings us a little more success out there, especially in the standing corn. Yeah. Especially our field there that got blown over by the tornadoes, which is mm-hmm. crazy December tornadoes. But yeah, I mean, the corn is broken off halfway up and it's just laying across all the rows. So you can't even walk down the rows. And I know the deer are in there, so it's like I don't know. It's just a mess. But we were thinking about not going about yeah, there. just mowing it yeah. down. But then I don't know. It's kind of close to the road. <laughs> <laughs> That's true too. <laughs> People might just yeah, they see a shed lane in a flat cut field. You know, they're gonna oh, what's that? They won't be able to. Well, I told JJ. On. So if any of you guys are listening out there, you shed poachers. <laughs> <laughs> that might be on a chain, and there might be a camera right next to it too. So watch your step. Well, I I can tell you, I I know guys who have done that who own big parcels down there in Illinois or Iowa. You know, like Illinois, I know a guy one time who he was getting sheds poached off him all the time, and he didn't live right there, and he knew it was happening. While and he'd catch the guy on trail camera, and nothing would ever come of it because he could never get the shed back, and they could never really prove it too much. Well, he ended up putting a big shed out there and he, he knew the guy was in there and, and had a trail camera there and they ended up pinching him right there down the road and because the shed was of x value i think he ended up getting in some big trouble for oh yeah because I mean, because they could value that horn it was such a big shed that they could value that horn well just trespassing life. alone i mean minnesota i know they can range anywhere from like 100 some bucks to well over a thousand dollars i mean it you can make it hurt. Yeah. Yeah. Well, before we, we move on to some cold weather stuff, I want to talk about a few more things, shed hunting. So, you know, we get the tendency to talk about, you know, uh, the ways that we shed hunt here in Minnesota, and it's hard to wrap our mind around how somebody in Louisiana might shed hunt because mm-hmm. it's different, but I think it's the same premise. So if you're out there and you're listening from somewhere different, out west, out east, south, it's, it's, again, just understanding what your deer are doing. So understand where they're bedding. Understand what the food source is. Yeah, their food source might not be a standing bean field. It might be, you know, browse or different grasses or whatever it is. Just try to understand that as much as possible and, and take the, the overall scheme and strategy and try to apply that to your area. You know, one of the, the things that we didn't talk about yet um, is the hinge cuts that, that Andy and AWS and you guys have put in out there at the property. Um, I know that that is a great place to find sheds because I know that, that as much as hinge cuts provide cover, they also provide a a huge food source and especially this time of year too. Um, so, you know, hinge cuts, is that, is that somewhere that I would imagine you guys are going to focus on shed hunting this year? Yeah, definitely going to walk through there. Did we find any in there last year? Well, here's the deal on that. The first year that we did the, um, the hinge cut, <clears throat> we didn't have great success there, but there was no food yet. 
Okay, so the when you're talking about food source and hinge cut, you're talking about woody brawls. You're talking about bringing food that's been in the air down to where they can reach it now. So that really just developed this last year to a level of like, wow, it was completely different environment. You could, it was funny because we walked in there and 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 I just remember standing there at the front edge of the hinge cut, not going down into it. And this was in the spring, late spring, early summer and standing there. And it was like, you walked into a sound studio booth. You didn't hear anything. It was just quiet. And every, as you look out, it's just like this gray matter, you know, and that's kind of how Andy explained it. Maybe JJ, you can fill people in on about the whole concept of creating that and, yeah, we walked in there and right off the football field there. And I think Brian was, were you filming that day? Yeah, and we walked in there. It was just real quiet and a lot of hinge cuts around. But it's not only the trees that are dropped that were re-sprouting, but it was everything that was coming up from the ground that now had sun. And it was like this, yeah, like a gray, like a hazy blanket, like a two foot, you know, two, three foot, just, I don't know how you, what's the Well, it, it, yeah, just look at it this way. Previously, when we had that same exact spot, when we walked that timber, we were looking for sheds. You could see Chris on the other side of the ravine and you'd wave your arm like, hey, I'm over here. That's gone. I mean, you can't detect anything within 20, 30 yards further at the most. All around you, you're just surrounded by it. And it was a, it was a very weird experience. I mean, that's why it's kind of hard to describe because I never expected anything even close to that. But boy, has that made a difference in the property. Well, just look what just happened this last yeah, year. Yeah, and they're eating all those little shoots too. There's like little trees and bushes and shrubs and mm-hmm. all kinds of stuff growing in there, all nibbled up on. We did find some. I think I did a shed hunting day kind of by myself, and I found a you know a bunch of, I'll call them scraps, you know, like six, six or so sheds that were smaller um, in some of those hinge cuts. We didn't really have anything big sticking around last year though because yeah like our food was gone but yeah definitely gonna grid search those hinge cut areas too and you know i think doing the timber cut on the other piece of land the reason we didn't timber that side was because there wasn't a lot of mature harvestable um timber to be honest with you um so the hinge cut served purpose of opening up new growth you know you don't cut every tree down so you can be selective of what trees that you want to get, you know, turn into these great, like these white oaks and different things like that. And then you can take advantage of, uh, you know, some of the, um, what is it, what are the ones that have the, the poplars or whatever that you can turn them over. They're great food source and they're kind of, I don't want to say they're invasive, but they're overly aggressive. And so you can kind of keep them under control and put like really good food. They like that. That's a real good food source for them. So there's just things you can do by doing hinge cut to benefit the management of the property. And now you go to this other side, which is completely different. Um, The Cedar Springs used to be crop and pasture back in the day, like what, 20, 50 years years ago. ago, Yeah. Yeah. And so it was, it was used in a different way where Oak roost has always just been straight up timber. And so you've got, We've run into 100-year-old white oaks in there. And so it's their mature oaks, your reds, your whites. It's a mature timber, and it needs to be cut because it's completely crowding the floor. And now we're getting invasives in there like that garlic mustard and things like that. And so we want to turn that by just cutting the timber. We're going to get the same benefit as we got by doing the hinge cut, only will actually harvest that material and it'll go toward commerce and do things that are good, you know, for the economy, for lots of different things. It'll do good for the environment. And these changes that we're making, what just blows my mind is the diversity that we are bringing in from a wildlife perspective, which is extremely noticeable. But now we're going to see the diversity of the you know, the, the plants and the different things like that and the health of the actual land is going to change significantly too and is changing right now. So people think, oh, you're going to go in and cut all the timber. Well, you know, or wait, maybe I don't have timber that I can go in and harvest. How can I still benefit or improve my habitat? 
there's different things you can do for different reasons. In this case, we're going to take the timber out, and it's going to have just as big of an effect. Um, now, we'll be able to kind of uh, control the habitat on the timber cut because they'll leave the tops in. And why don't you, you can talk about that strategy a little bit. Yeah, I think that's a whole other podcast when we oh, get the loggers true. here. That's but a um, lot. yeah. We were talking about just going back to kind of shed hunting aspect of it. We wanted the, the loggers to come in right away in January when the season closed so we could get those tops down for the deer and hopefully pull more sheds in. But I don't I don't know yet what's going to happen there. So now we're kind of on the other end of it where we're hoping uh, deer can shed before we cut too many trees. So either way, hopefully find some sheds. Find some sheds and build some infrastructure. That's kind of the angle I was kind of going to get to, but yeah, that's a different podcast. So sheds and infrastructure. Absolutely. I want to talk about uh, a place that I've found a lot of sheds actually here more recently in the last couple of years. And you can speak to it because it's kind of not physically your backyard, but it's similar situation. So these deer, I found more sheds focusing on thermal cover than anything. So these kind of uh, big pine stands, right? I you You pay attention to and it goes to understanding where your deer are bedding, but here it gets so cold. Where is that heat being captured? Where is it being, what, where are, are, can deer feel warm? Well, to me, there's a few different answers to that. One is south-facing slopes, right? So we haven't talked about that yet. Deer bed on south-facing slopes because they get the most sun, uh, you know, throughout the day. So they want to go where it's warm. It also melts off things faster so they can access browse and different food sources as that sun melts it off, but warmth. And then the other places is thermal cover. So areas like, uh, um, thick cedar pockets or these big pine stands that, that will hold in that heat. I think I found more sheds in those spots too, over the last couple of years, just focusing on those areas. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to say something based on what you just got done um, describing about my backyard. We got a buck back there that's hanging out called Pitchfork. What is he, three and a half, Jay? Beautiful three and a half, by the way. Uh, but if you follow any of my personal stuff, you I'm sure you've seen it there because I'll be sitting there watching TV, you know, come out and he'll be in the backyard and I get all excited. So does the wife. But so, but he he actually, and this is a little angle to what you said. He actually is betting on a little bit of a slope between the two houses, the, the, two, the two whatever, two-acre lots. And mine's all surrounded by timber, by the way. And I have a big pine row like you're talking about, okay? And then I also have like a rough timber with a few pines sprinkled in there. And he's actually on a slope that goes down to the north, but he sits on the top edge of that where he catches that south type sun now the reason he would be on the south side of it but that's my lawn well he's not going to go out and bed in the middle of the lawn you know the fawns and does would but he won't so i just want people to kind of keep that you know it's, it's the same thing we're saying the exact same thing but also if you don't have a south facing slope i'm just trying to give you another alternative to, to keep in your mind the sun is a big deal yeah, and as far as when it gets super, super cold, it's either got to be in the sun. And, and this is actually, you've just made me process this for the first time ever. I could never figure out why the does and fawns and deer would go down in that pine straw, other than I knew the pine straw was good for thermal. Obviously, you brought that up. But I thought to myself, well, why wouldn't they go sit in the sun? You know what I mean? But now they're doing both. They won't go on the, the, you know, the non-sun side if they don't have pine needle bed. But if they have pine needle bed, they don't care if they have sun. I guess that's the point I'm trying to get to. And I just put two and two together just now on that. Yeah, I, I think, you know. Like I said, look for, if you have thermal cover, it's a good spot to find deer bedded this time of year. <laughs> They're looking, at least here in the Midwest, Minnesota, trying to stay warm. Yeah, I found some pretty good sheds and those cedar pocket type things, areas, like on Cedar Springs, um, as an example. Another curious thing that I was thinking about, because really the thermal thing is like, it's blocking the wind, you know, like those pine trees, it's not, the wind's not blasting through there, getting them real cold. Um be curious to see how switchgrass works too 
Yeah, that will be good. Because that's like, well, it'll be a six, seven foot tall like wall. You know, I don't know if that'll block it enough to warm them up when we get that established. Well, I, I will say this, like, and I experienced this this fall a little bit. Like, you you walk into somewhere that has grown grass, switchgrass, CRP grass, like, you know, tall, thick grass, and you walk into a spot like that versus somewhere else, it's it's noticeably warmer. You know, you walk into there and you can tell that it's warmer in there. So, you know, you find a lot of sheds in CRP, switchgrass areas. Well, one, it's because a lot of times they melt off faster. They're good for transition areas. So deer just naturally spend a lot of time in them. But I think too, they they melt off faster and they, and they hold more heat than some of those other areas. Maybe if there's not a south facing slope and there is no sun, I think they're 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 warmer and deer like to be there more than maybe some other areas. Yeah, and our Swiss grass is not fully mature yet either, and we don't really have it. And we just basically tested it to see if it's going to grow. Now we're actually going to put it in as a part of the infrastructure and habitat, and you know, then we're going to lose our bean field there, but that's okay. We got other places for beans. That's where you need a dog to walk those switchgrass areas yeah, too. Cause that's pretty tough. Right. Um, you know, one thing that we didn't touch on either, uh, when it comes to shed hunting is, is just the historical, you know, places that you find sheds. Maybe Mike, you did touch on a little bit, but you know, I mentioned in the last podcast, there's the, the oldest deer on one of the farms that I hunt right now. Um, uh, uh, least partner of mine, Lance, found um, his sheds last year. And then right at the end of the season this year, we got pictures of him again for the first time going back into that kind of bedding area where we know he was last year because we found his sheds. So I will be interested to see, and we'll have to report back, whether we find his sheds close to there again or not. And again, this is the oldest year that we know of, Buck, on, on this farm. But I, if I were a betting man, um, I think that that we would have a good chance to find his sheds right there in that in that same area. So I think that's you know something to look at if you have the opportunity to look at historical data or past shed hunting experiences. You know, look at you know obviously when your deer is shedding and where they're shedding because again they they find those places that they like to be that time of year. I'm going to add two elements to that statement. One is if you go in there too soon, you're probably not going to find them sheds there. You know, so you have to keep that in mind. And the other thing is, and we didn't really say it this time, but we've talked about it before, but that pattern, they like to stake the bigger bucks, especially like to travel less distance to food this time of year because they are so wore down. So they like the convenience of having, having the bedding and the food fairly close by. Obviously, they're not running that two, three mile loop anymore. So those are a couple things that, you know, and that's where you can use your cameras to your advantage, like we just lost one for a few days, so now we're getting all, oh, God, did he rebed? Did he go, you know, did he go back to his traditional spot? We didn't find him last year, so we don't know where that is. And so, yeah, I mean, I just want to throw that angle in there too. Don't go in there and bump them. I mean, if you got that pattern, if it can be, if it's consistent, you have you got to have the discipline. Or if you can find him on camera, oh, be shed, let's go, you know. Such a crucial thing, cameras. You know the 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 revolutionary technology that's that trail cameras gives us these days is is amazing. I mean, running reveals year round, not just during the hunting season. Pretty awesome. I'm going to throw something out there about the trail camera. They're starting to get picky about this stuff. It's becoming a hot topic, and I'm just going to say, if you want the deer management and the harvest to be at a certain level, then by God, you better not be trying to outlaw things. But now on the other side of it, I understand the controversy on the public land. It can get out of hand and needs to be managed at some level. Now, does that have to be done legislatively or just the rules of the park or whatever? I don't know. But I mean, that's a whole podcast in itself. But, you know, don't get on this banning cell cams because of some stupid reason that you don't understand. If you want deer harvest to be good and you want to manage the deer, you need to let the hunters use these tools to be successful. That's my stance on it. JJ, what's your stance on it? No comment on that. <laughs> <laughs> no, I love the cell cams. Obviously, they changed the game on 
every aspect of hunting, shed hunting. Um, and just deer management, deer behavior in general. I mean, you learn so much about habitat and what you can and can't do. And it's just, there, there's lots of things they do. Yeah. Very beneficial for sure. I love them. Use them 19 to 27 times a day. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Well, guys, I think, you know, we're running out of time here. We were going to talk about cold weather gear. Um, maybe we save that podcast for next week uh, and, and just tackle that whole entire topic with how the heck do you stay warm outside right now in Minnesota? Well, Wonder Bread bags. <laughs> Wonder bread bags and socks. You heard it <laughs> and here. Socks under First, your mittens. <laughs> Mike will be out there shed hunting in wonder bread socks. <laughs> wonder bread bags and mittens or socks. We'll, we'll we'll document it for sure. We'll bring it to you. Look <laughs> look on Facebook. But um, hey, thanks for listening. Hopefully you learned something. Hopefully you can apply some of those tactics out there and and hopefully find some sheds. We're gonna keep you updated. We're gonna keep rocking these podcasts throughout the new year. So if you haven't done so, make sure you subscribe on YouTube. Download the free Deer Society app. We appreciate you listening, watching. We're going to do some podcasts too here coming up where we want to hear your questions. I'm going to do a lot more of that this year, so uh, answering your questions. So make sure to keep shooting us that feedback, and uh, good luck out there in the woods.